Welcome one and all to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. It's time once again to pour up a glass and pull up a cheer as we gather together here in our favorite corner of the Cross Time Pub, raising our Guinness glasses and hoping to keep a little luck of the Irish along the way. I am Micah Hanks, and joining me as always, my comrades, Mr. Jason Pintrill. How are you, sir? Doing great. Deep in the holiday season, one down, two to go. That's right, and I'm missing my teen geologist, James Waldo. I think you're almost like the real Waldo. I haven't. I feel like I haven't seen you in forever. I keep texting him. He's probably getting worried. Why does Micah miss me so much? I just haven't seen you in a while. James, how are you doing? I'm doing well, and it is a little bit concerning, but uh, <laughs> here I am. No, no need to be concerned anymore because. I'm on the scene, man. Good. Well, no better scene to be on than that, which, of course, occurs in this corner of the Cross Time Pub. Fellas, looking outside this morning at my little bunker abode up in Appalachia, I was amazed to see what I believe was the first snow of the season. Yeah. Yeah, well, they're calling for it here in central North Carolina. I just don't think it's going to happen. But, you know, rain and uh, sleet maybe, but I doubt that we'll get snow. James, I'm sure you got snow in Savannah, right? (laughs) (laughs) Hey, last year, they got the first measurable snowfall in 30 years here. So um, I don't really expect a replay of that this year. But, you know, if we do have a replay, it means, you know, maybe it's a trend. I don't know. There's some weird climate news going on right now, which I don't actually intend to get into, but something I do would definitely want to bring to the table. In fact, I think we would be... Uh, truly uh, forsaking our duty as podcasters if we didn't talk about this. Because as you know, in the past on the show, we have devoted a fair amount of time to discussion about the Younger Dryas. Now, not just the ever popular and ultimately controversial impact theory associated with that. As you know, I'm very interested in the Younger Dryas in general. And also, of course, the potential reasons that caused it. Now, what we're talking about is that little cold reversal that occurred as we're exiting the Pleistocene. The conventional wisdom tells us that as meltwater runoff was filling the Atlantic and it was cooling the Atlantic, this, of course, being previously frozen ice from the glaciers themselves during the Ice Age, that it disrupts the thermohaline circulation and that causes a proportional decrease in global temperatures for about a thousand years. Then it warms up again and we enter the Holocene. Uh, Then there's the impact theory which looks at there being a far more catastrophic cause behind that cold reversal that occurs uh, in between our exit of the Pleistocene and entrance into the Holocene. But this latest study that came out, we all saw this here at Seven Ages. The guys and I have been talking about this an awful lot. And so for the time being, we will merely report the facts. Here is what was found. The discovery of what may be a city-sized impact crater, and that the first ever found below glacial ice was announced by an international team of scientists on Wednesday. We did a write-up about this over at sevenages.org, the original paper published in Science Advances. Now, dating of this impact feature, while inconclusive, indicates that it could be as recent as 12,000 to 15,000 years old. And as the fellows know, of course, that means that that would be right around the time of the Younger Dryas. So some have suggested that this impact feature, if that's what it is, could correlate with the Younger Dryas. Now, People have raised questions about this, and there are a lot of different angles that we could take. I think the most important thing to do right now is to acknowledge that if there is an impact feature, and this is anything that can roughly be correlated with the Younger Dryas, that is interesting to me. Of course, what I also saw when this came out was people who are proponents of the traditional perspective on this are saying, no, 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 this has been debunked several times. This doesn't mean anything. Now, the problem I have with that, of course, is does that mean that you're unwilling to look at new evidence if it's already been debunked? 
that doesn't seem very scientific to me. Now, on the other side, the impact proponents, many of them were saying, here it is. We've got the shot across the bow. You know, we've got the linchpin. This is going to be what proves it. I don't know that either of those perspectives are A, truly scientific, or B, warranted. I think we still need to wait for further data. But as more and more data does accumulate, can we just turn a blind eye to that? In other words, if we keep seeing discoveries like this and the evidence continues to point toward the idea of an impact, can we say that that has been debunked? I mean, eventually we may have to change our minds about this. What are your thoughts? Personally, I'm still going to be somewhat conservative in, in my thinking about this. You know, like I said before, you know, the, the evidence for the Younger Dries impact is stacking up, but there's still more work to be done in relation to this crater, in relation to, you know, some of the other things. What, what's undeniable, though, is there definitely is a crater under the uh, Greenland ice sheet. And it does appear that the uh, ice that, that exists in that crater is no older than about 15,000 years. Still, though, there's probably other ways that can be interpreted. I don't know what they are off the top of my head, but um, we're going to have to let the people that do this stuff for a living you know, and get out there and actually collect the data, collect more data. And uh, but when, whenever you know, we're gonna we're gonna reach a breakover point where, like they say in civil court cases, the preponderance of the evidence leans towards this, and we think we probably got this thing figured out. Now, what we don't have figured out though is how all of these different things conspire together at the end of the Pleistocene to cause the climatic conditions and the cold and the rebound and the cold and the rebound how all of that played together as a system to produce the effects that we saw later. So, and that's the part that's pretty interesting is, so if you know, if there's certain things in play, you can recognize those conditions, you know, maybe in the future or in other times in the past. And you can say, we know that when, or we think we know that when we had these types of conditions, these are the kinds of effects that we, we suspect. So sometimes when you, you can do it the other way around, we know what causes these types of effects. So now we have to go and hunt and see if we can falsify our hypothesis. I like the way you say it, man. Again, I think the problem I'm seeing is that there are the two camps, the warring factions. And Jason, I want to come over to you in a second. But, you know, again, it seems evident to me that there are people who are all in on it being an impact. And there's some data now actually forthcoming. There's more and more data supporting that. But then there's that consensus view and the people who are of that mind they won't have any of the new evidence. So, you know, neither side is willing to give any. They're already essentially in the position to say that, hey, our minds are made up. And to me, that's not how science works. Jason, what do you think? Well, I think with any situation like this or similar to this, uh, we've just had the information released to us. And as you know, grand as it may be and as excited as people are about it, uh, I think we've just been introduced to the information and now we need to proceed with caution uh, we need to make sure that we're employing every aspect of uh, good scientific research. And uh, I think it's kind of good, you know, that people are excited about it because the articles have been out on social media. They've been making their, their uh, trips around the Internet and everybody's talking about it and discussing it. And for a lot of people, it's the first time they've been introduced to this idea of a potential impact. But as we move forward, uh, as we tend to do here at Seven Ages and in, in the world of science, let's move with uh, precaution. Let's move with uh, you know lots of focus, lots of research, and continue to talk to one another. That's important that we're not arguing about it, but that we're having good discussions that are moving the, the science forward and that are moving the potential of what this could mean forward together. And we're not opposing one another. So, yeah, I just think it's uh, is it it is exciting. It's 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 something that we've been thinking about for a long time. It's something that we've had in the back of our minds, but as we move forward with the research, it needs to be done properly. And I think it's only going to benefit for everybody to be on the same page and communicate with each other. Absolutely. Well, both of you, very well said. I mean, I think that we've pretty much articulated our position on this. You know, we are going to abstain from further judgment pending further evidence, but we are very eager to see where the evidence is going to lead. I just hope that our friends in the scientific community and also maybe some of the avocationalist or the, you know, the weekend warrior type researchers who are a little more like us, although you guys, of course, are actually scientists. I'm the, what would you call it, the autodidact of the team. Uh, mm. Wherever you stand, wh whatever your profession is or whatever your background as it relates to researching these, these subjects may be, uh, I hope that people are willing to, like you said, Jason, look at the evidence, and let's have discussions about it. Let's not resort to attacking one another. And this is one of those subjects that for some reason has become extraordinarily volatile. 
And there are people on both sides of the camp that will argue their case and also why the other people are not only wrong, but why what they're doing is disruptive. We definitely need more dialogue and we definitely need to be able to keep our eye on further developments because at some point, one of two things is going to happen. We are going to have enough data that we can say, no, that didn't happen, or we will have to change our minds and say a new perspective on what occurred in the ancient past is required here for us to be able to explain all the phenomena. Again, let's not lead with biases. Let's wait and see where the evidence goes. James, speaking of waiting and seeing where the evidence goes, there was a mystery reported in the news recently. I've been following this one. I know that you've been keeping an eye on this also. What are seismologists saying is occurring in our oceans right now? Yeah, so this the, the story about the uh, strange earthquake, the strange ripple that went around the world. You know, This is actually kind of a cool story. The basis of the story is there was a seismic event uh, a few miles off of uh, Mayotte uh, Island, which is off the, it's a French island, it's off the coast of, east coast of uh, Africa, kind of in the Madagascar area, I guess you could say. There's a little bit of seismic activity around this island anyway, and it's a volcanic island. And I think the island has been, you know, it's kind of been, I want to say on the move, but, you know, geologically speaking, this thing's cruising along about two inches a year or so. So they pick up this signal. And it's not the normal earthquake signature, right? So the way earthquakes work, you know, there are earthquakes are like a sudden jolt or like release of energy. So you get two two basic waves with with uh, earthquakes. You get the P wave and the S wave, the primary wave and the secondary wave. So the primary wave is like a compression wave, like a like compressing a slinky, you know, uh, longitudinally like that. And then the S wave is is a slower wave that comes along a certain amount of time behind the P wave. And it's more of a, like a side to side oscillation. And then the third wave is the, are the surface waves. And those are the actual ripples that actually move across the surface of the earth. And they'll go all the way around the earth, but we'll never feel them because they have such a long period. So in this case, basically what we got was surface waves. And it was this very, tight waveform and it rang for 17 seconds and then it, it repeated. So I had the 17 second period. What's weird about it, I guess, or, or what the story is saying is they've never seen anything like this before. So they go on to speculate about some different things that could cause it, you know, like magmatic intrusions into the crust of the earth and some different things, but that happens all the time. And so those are you know, the signatures for those things are known. So one of the seismologists goes on to say that the waveform is too perfect. It doesn't look natural, but there's no industry or anything in the area. So they can't really, they didn't really speculate on what could have caused it. But basically what they're saying is, is, uh, is that it could have a man-made origin. Really? Yeah. 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 So, um, now what that is, I don't know, but I do, I do think there might, that, that might there might be something going on there because in some ways the earth is fairly predictable how the earth moves in the you know that this is daily stuff you know as far as crustal displacements and small earthquakes and all of these types of things and uh every once in a while you'll get some some weird you know some weird thing like this and in this case i i, I do think it might have it might have an artificial origin what it could what could cause it now that i don't know I know that a lot of people kind of go off in different areas of thought and imagination when you say something like this, because it has a very compelling sound. It's an artificial origin. What in the world is that? But I'm reminded of something, and I talked about this a little on one of my other podcasts, but it's relevant here. Back in the 1990s, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, had been using uh, deep-sea moored hydrophones that were holdovers from back in the days when we were using them to spy on you know, Soviet uh, submarines and things like this. There were literally, you know, spy apparatus from the Cold War era that our government used. And since these microphones are out there and they're still active, but we're no longer using them for espionage purposes, they're repurposed by NOAA to study sounds in nature or whatever else might turn up. And there were all kinds of interesting recordings that were made in the early 1990s. And my favorite, of course, which I uh, talked about was called Bloop. And there had been a theory at that time, not that it was something manufactured per se, Although I think a lot of those noises, strange though they sounded, were probably things like whale song, or they may have been motorboat engines, or drilling operations, things like that. But what's important to remember is that in the region of the ocean where these microphones were moored, it's known as the deep sound channel. And the deep sound channel, James, you probably know some about this. It's an actual area where 
at that depth in the ocean, the pressure causes sound waves to travel for very long distances. And so what can end up happening is that if that sound from, for instance, a nearby drilling operation or whatever else the source may be, if it is detected by a microphone in that area, it may actually have an origin point much further away due to the physics of the ocean environment at that depth. And so these deep sea hydrophones were placed in that area of the ocean with that in mind. And sometimes the sources of the recordings were much further away as a result of what was being recorded and how it was being recorded. So that said, there are sometimes much more mundane explanations. But interestingly, that bloop noise I mentioned, there had been a theory that I think was proposed by biologist Phil Lobel at the time. And I actually emailed him. I corresponded with him about this. He thought that there could be a very large deep sea organism, some sort of a creature, and a funny kind of a point that ties into mythology, because I think that that idea was pretty roundly debunked. I don't see any evidence in support of a massive deep sea creature, but people had said that it seemed to originate that noise best they could tell from a area way out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And this is a place that has a lot of different names, but it's basically the point furthest from land anywhere in, in the world, to tell you the truth, in one of our oceans, which is out in the middle of the South Pacific. And they said it essentially came from that area, but H.P. Lovecraft wrote about that in, yeah, in the Call of Cthulhu, right? He talked about that being the location where Relay, the sunken city, was found. And so a lot of people joke that the monster was actually a Lovecraftian ancient one. I doubt that's what has been detected by these seismologists, folks. Who knows what it was, but due to the, due to the physics of the ocean and the way that these things are carried over distance, I have some ideas about what we might have been hearing there. Yeah, you know... I, I know a little bit about the bloop uh, myself, and uh, if you listen to the recording of that, the, the, you know the, there was a much sped up version of it that actually sounded like the bloop. But the but the actual recording, you couldn't, you know, you wouldn't have you wouldn't have caught it. But what you were talking about with the the mechanism that causes sound waves to move long distance in the ocean is it's the, called the uh, thermocline. Mm -hmm. Once you get down to a certain depth, you transition from the warmer upper water in the ocean to the cold water and it i mean it's a pretty sharp divide and uh and there's such a there's such a change in the in the density of the water because of the salinity and the and the temperature differences that it actually reflects sound both ways so submarines when they play their hide and seek games um submarines that are above the thermocline have a very difficult time uh, detecting submarines that are below the thermocline. So sometimes the, the submarines, especially the hunter submarines, they'll have a towed sonar array and they'll let that array uh, drift down below the, the layer of the thermocline so they can listen below that without actually being detected by the submarines that are below it. It's very interesting. We may have to do a regular espionage segment, guys. What do you think? Add it to the list, right? The topics are ever growing. Well, you know, speaking of topics, uh, turning from the geologic to the more anthropological, uh, I've got an update for you guys. So, uh, first of all, a lot of people may not even be aware of this, but I think it's important to know. Um, and it's concerning the trip that we recently made uh, to Moundville, Alabama. Um, and what I'm referring to is a massive burglary that happened there in 1980. So, uh, back in 1980, hundreds of Pottery vessels, uh, bottles, bowls, ornaments, jewelry items, they were all stolen from the Erskine Ramsey Archaeological Repository at the University of Alabama, Moundville Archaeological Park. So you guys remember when we went in, it was kind of off to the right there in the distance. Well, back in 1980, a group of people or an individual, they still don't really know, went in and stole a huge amount of items, uh, all of which were uh, vital to telling the story of Moundville. Uh, now, back in 1980, the FBI did investigate, but they dropped the case that same year. Uh, Jim Knight, who is the curator emeritus of uh, American archaeology for the Alabama Museum of Natural History at the University of Alabama, he helped uh, organize what's known as the Associates for the Recovery of Moundville Artifacts. Uh, what they did was establish a fund, basically a reward, uh, for any information leading to any of the items that were stolen from 1980. Uh, they were actually able to raise $13,000. Uh, once the word got out, other donors started contributing. Uh, they ended up contributing another $12,000, making total $25,000. Uh, and the publicity seems to have worked. So while certainly not all of the items were recovered, they have recovered three of the vessels, and they've been returned now to Moundville. Uh, one of the vessels depicts an engraved skull 
and the skeletal forearm bones and a hand design with the straight crosses inside, um, you know, that, that hemp hill style that we've become so familiar with. Uh, the other two vessels depicted a winged serpent, a deity that features a rattlesnake tail with the wings and the deer antlers. Uh, we remember seeing that when we were there at the site. Um, according to Jim, he says, we were thinking we'd go to our graves without anything turning up from this burglary. This is one of the most exciting things that has happened during my archaeological career. University of Alabama officials at this time aren't releasing any information about the criminal investigation, but they are saying that no one has been arrested and no one has claimed any of the $25,000 reward money. But most importantly, uh, three of the missing vessels have been returned. Uh, most likely, they were probably sold at some point um, from individuals or possibly through an auction site, something like that. Um, went into private collections and then these private collectors probably recognized that, hey, these are part of the inventory that we're taking taken from Moundville and ultimately returned them. That's just speculation. I don't know that to be the case, but having seen this sort of thing occur before, I can sort of envision that type of scenario. Jason, you know, I wonder sometimes, we've talked, of course, countless times, at least between the three of us about Spiro Mound, okay, out there in Oklahoma. And when we were on our southern trip, that site, a little too far west for us to be able to get out there, but one of the most famous archaeological sites of the Mississippian period, and also one of the most famously looted sites. And I often wondered, you know, what have we lost along the way? What was looted and essentially stolen and then sold off? And his, it may have remained in somebody's collection who appreciated those things back in the days of the antiquarians, but, I mean, where did those things end up eventually? Were they sold off? Did they end up being inherited by somebody who didn't give a rip, basically, about archaeology? And who knows how many countless treasures? But you go even further back. And you look at the, the era where antiquarians were going to Egypt and removing cultural artifacts from that location and from all different parts of the world where, in the ancient world, things that could tell us key elements about the past that are missing from our prehistoric record, uh, we may have found them, but they were probably lost. Who knows whose private collection or what dumpster they may have ended up in? I mean, it's really horrific when you think about all of the information about the past that has been lost. So... If there's one thing that is indeed hopeful, it is when something like this comes to pass, where we find treasures that have been lost and then they are recovered. It doesn't happen often. I wish it happened a lot more, but any time it does, you know, we're counting our lucky stars thinking that this information is now reclaimed and we can hopefully preserve it better than we did in the past. Also, why in the world did the FBI close that investigation after just a year? That makes no sense. Yeah, it appears that it wasn't even a full year. They basically said, yep, these things have been taken we can't find them. Case closed. Oh, my and, gosh. Uh, uh, you know, ultimately, the black market for these types of goods are, are massive, whether it's Egypt or whether it's Native American sites, whatever it is, there's a market. There's a huge underground black market of dealers and all these type of things. And that's not to say that every dealer and auction site and all that is involved with this type of thing, but we all know that it does happen. Uh, ultimately, uh, what we've ended up here with is a very rare instance when something actually gets returned back to its place of origin and uh, we just have to be thankful that the Moundville site has three more uh, beautiful pieces to display in their museum and that they've you know, made it home. And hopefully in the future, such programs, such initiatives, rewards, things like that will lead to the return of other items because Moundville is certainly not the only site that's ever been robbed or looted. Yeah, to say the least. That's good news, man. I mean, that's, that's pretty exciting, especially since we were just out there. You know, it hits home a little bit more being that we were just there. Well, I mean, the more that we get out, guys, and we experience... Uh, again, the wonders of the past ourselves in the field. Uh, you know, the the more respectful I become in terms of the way I think about and approach uh, anthropology and archaeology and history and all these things, uh, you know, the more respectful I become of the indigenous cultures of America and other parts of the world and the treasures that are a part of their heritage. I remember Indiana Jones uh, famously saying, Dad, it belongs in a museum, but in truth, Sometimes there are things that don't belong in museums. Now, I'm a big fan of museums, obviously, because they preserve the past. However, I think in terms of being conscientious about what the things that we observe from the past may mean to people of today, we need to look at that aspect, too. So however you look at it, I'm very glad that we have regained uh, these, these lost treasures of the ancient past. And uh, I hope sincerely that in the coming years there will be more stories like this, Jason. Well, it's funny that you mentioned that because there, there are more stories. And you know what? Uh, one quick note on that. You know, you talk about the discoveries and the museums and displaying. 
Well, as we're moving forward, technology is moving forward with us. And now we're getting to the point with ground penetrating radar and various LIDAR and all these other things that we can use that they're having to do less digging and we're able to find out more about the things that lie beneath the surface without necessarily disturbing them. So as we move forward, I think archaeology and anthropology are going to kind of catch up with that and change. And we, who knows what those disciplines may look like 50, 100 years from now. But sometimes, as we know, uh, artifacts and treasures from the past just reveal themselves to us. And that is what has recently happened on the Emerald Isle over in Ireland. Scientific dating has now confirmed that the remains of a log boat found in the River Boyne close to the New Grange World Heritage Site dates to the Neolithic period over 5,000 years ago. Now, this is a big deal. This is a big story because, you know, here in the southeast, we don't get preservation of things like that. Not too often. Sometimes down in Florida, we'll get old wooden canoes and things like that that wash out. But due to the climate here, we don't get a lot of natural materials that, that preserve well. In this case, it has preserved well, and it's, it's giving some real insight to the cultures from the Neolithic period there in Ireland. So this prehistoric boat, what they refer to as a log boat, was found actually back in June of 2016 by four local anglers while they were out fishing um, in uh, what's known as the Old Bridge River in County Meath. Um, of course, they immediately reported it to heritage authorities, which is the right thing to do. So, you know, kudos to them for doing the right thing. The remains of the vessel itself consisted of about three meters uh, length of wood, which would have been formed, basically would have been the bottom, the base of the boat. Um, it's estimated that the log boat was originally more than four meters long. It was shaped out of the trunk of an old oak tree using stone axes. So very similar to what we see here in North America. This discovery is one of 11 log boats found on that river, um, though this is the first one that can be dated all the way back to the Neolithic period. So a sample of the wood has been recently radiocarbon dated, and it showed between 3300 and 2900 BC. Uh, this is the period of the construction of the Great Passage Tomb at Newgrange, which we'll discuss here soon, and the National Monument Service uh, underwater Archaeology Unit and the National Museum of Ireland collaborated in recording the boat and uh, carefully removing it from the riverbed. And it's now at museum facilities where it's going under undergoing conservation and hopefully will you know, add to the collection of what they already have with the other 11 log boats. So uh, one thing is a lot of people wouldn't actually notice that this was an artifact or that this was something from the past. So, you know, good on those uh, fishermen for recognizing its importance and calling the right people to have it come out and be preserved and conserved in the way that it is being uh, done right now currently. But uh, often, you know, I just like to tell people, if you're not sure what something is, call somebody and have them come out and look at it. Because oftentimes, if you're not familiar with looking at old artifacts and things from the past, you may just overlook something and not realize the importance. Often things that are found which have relevance to archaeology may not even be identifiable as such to the untrained eye. So, I'm right there with you. I'm also right there with you, Jason, in terms of that fascination that you have for boats. Boats are interesting because it has long been held that watercraft didn't exist when you go far enough back, and therefore there wasn't evidence of, again, a very controversial idea over the years, and that is diffusion. And there are reasons why the idea of diffusion is controversial because, of, of course, it's a logical conclusion in some regards. How did certain people get from one part of the world to another? How were certain areas of the world colonized and occupied. I mean, there are obviously a lot of questions about the ancient world and who was getting around, where they were going, how they got there. But eventually you get to a point where on the nearer side of sanity, I mean, we can't say that people all around the world in ancient times, you know, the Atlanteans were sailing their vessels around and all this kind of stuff. I mean, definitely there is a limit to it. And and you can get so crazy and so far out there that it becomes fringe. But but there's also a logical case to be made for watercraft in ancient times. And so as time goes on, people are opening up to this idea more and more. You know, they're saying maybe instead of a bearing land bridge, people were bouncing along the coasts and they were using, you know, rafts or, or other kinds of watercraft, perhaps enhanced with seal skin, which was water repellent naturally. And they were actually getting into America that way. There are a lot of different things that we can learn from the study of ancient sailing vessels uh, which are not in the crazy camp when it comes to the idea of ancient diffusion. So, yeah, I, I share that penchant that you have right there for watercraft, as well as, of course, the area of Ireland you're talking about. And when we come back after this break, we're going to be delving into some of that. We're going to be looking at the tombs and the styles and the eras, the periods, and some of the famous artifacts and, of course, the monuments 
that exist there. But before we do, we've got a couple of thank yous that we have to pay to our friends out there in the listening audience. Peter Arvidson, by the way, a fellow who has sent along a lot of information to me and uh, sent us $10 in the form of a donation with a note. He said, guys, thanks for the tip on the PBS Native America series. I think it's become a favorite for all of us here in the Crosstime Pub. Truly one of the best documentary series I've seen uh, having to do with archaeology in recent years. And he says, it was truly well done. Here's a few cash dollars for gas money. So thank you, Peter, for that. And also over in the Emerald Isle, Nikki Hart, who suggested that we do this special episode on some of the myths, the wonders, the archaeological treasures of Ireland. We're going to be getting into all kinds of stuff. Nikki has sent me a lot of information over the years as well. So to all the many folks out there in our listening audience who support our work, uh, we thank you so much. And if you would like to do so, head over to sevenages.org. Of course, there's the donation button, but you can also email us. That would be Jason, James, or Micah at sevenages.org. Those are the email addresses. Don't forget, of course, to follow us at Seven Ages Research on Twitter. You can find Seven Ages Research also on YouTube and Instagram. Just look for that term, Seven Ages Research. And now we will take our research to one of my favorite places in the world that I've never been, but I eventually want to go. The Emerald Isle, Ireland, is going to be our focus when we return here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Guys, it's my supposition that any time that you discuss the Emerald Isle, uh, you need to start in the beginning, and I mean the beginning, the beginning. So in this case, we're gonna we're gonna start off with the geology of Ireland. So in other words, even before Guinness, even before Guinness, first the Earth was formed, and then there were the dinosaurs, but they all died and turned into oil. Well, okay, maybe not that far back. So geology of Ireland, just a quick overview here. So. This is from the Geological Survey of Ireland's website, which they actually have a, a very good one. And Ireland has a relatively small uh, area, 70,000 square kilometers. But it, for such a small area, it has a pretty diverse geological background. So the study of, I'm just going to read right from, the, right from their website here because it's such a good write-up. But the study of plate tectonics tells us that Ireland once had a very different setting. Hundreds of millions of years ago, the land with, that makes up Ireland as we know it today existed on two lost continents known as Laurentia and Gondwana that were separated by a prehistoric ocean called Lapidus. The northern part of Ireland was located on the lost continent of Laurentia, which would go on to form large parts of today's North American plate. The southern part of the island was located on Gondwana, which would later make up large parts of Europe. 420 million years ago, the two continents collided the impact of this collision can be seen in the way mountains over much of the island display long axes that trend northeast to southwest, a direction that reflects the line along which the plates clashed. A scar from Dingle on the west coast to Cloggerhead on the east shows the line which, along which the two continents combined. Uh, the land that is now Ireland then moved north close to the equator at this time, known as the Carboniferous period. A sea extended across Ireland allowing for the, for the formation of the sedimentary rocks such as sandstone and mudstone. So over the next 50 million years, limestone deposits formed in the warm waters. So one more note here of an of a, of a area in Ireland that we have some interest in is the Giant's Causeway, which mm -hmm. is columns of distinct black basalt that formed around 60 million years ago when the Atlantic reopened and caused seafloor spreading. This separation caused increased volcanic activity and allowed lava to spread over what is now Antrim and Derry. I'm glad you mentioned Giant's Causeway. Of course, we've talked about that a few times in the past. After I went out to Wyoming and saw Devil's Tower, that was not only the first thing I thought about, but again, relating to those basalt uh, formations, columnar joining, is that what it's called? Yeah, columnar joining. Yeah. Some of those at Devil's Tower are huge. I mean, and I don't know if at Giant's Causeway they're the same, because often I see images of the formation in photographs, but not with people standing next to them. At Devil's Tower, I can tell you right now, I mean, they, may, they might be big enough to fill the entire wall across from me here in the studio. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they, 
that actually come, they'll come, those columns will come in all kinds of different sizes, just from like a few inches apart to like, you know, feet across. So, um, so yeah, I think the giant causeway, uh, a lot of those columns are, are fairly good size, you know, maybe a foot or two across. Yeah, and of course, there's that famous legend, hence the name Giant's Causeway. I believe it was Finn McCool, right? Was that the name of the uh, the giant who was associated with that area? I've always loved those stories. And a little later on, we will get some more stories, some of the myths and the many wonders of Ireland into this conversation. But first, I want to kind of come back around and look at the archaeological periods of Ireland. Because when I first started studying megaliths, uh, you know, I know personally I had some confusion about this, and I know a lot of other people do. And it's going to help us, I think, if we look at the different periods and the kinds of archaeological features that can be related to each of those. And as we go along here, Jason, maybe we can try and relate this not only to the high civilization of ancient Greece and Egypt, but also, of course, to the archaeological eras in North America that we study when we're looking at, for instance, the Archaic period, the Middle Archaic, early woodland, and some of the things that have more relevance to what we've talked about recently on the show. So we began, as far as Ireland goes, with the Mesolithic period, 8,000 B.C. to around 4,000 B.C., and the earliest recorded inhabitants of Ireland appear to have arrived sometime around 8,000 B.C., and most likely on boats coming over from what is now Britain. They were hunter-gatherers. They would have exploited seasonal fruits, nuts, and berries, as well as, well as stalked large game and fished the surrounding seas and inland waterways. Uh, some of the best-known Mesolithic sites also include St. Sandal and County Derry. Uh, we've got a lot of them, actually, and we're going to get a little more into that a little later. But uh, a lot of these sites had associated hearths used for warmth and for cooking. There was also a certain symbolism associated with the hearth, according to many traditions. It was essentially roughly equivalent to the sun, and the table that you put in front of that, of course, uh, had a very symbolic kind of importance in that regard, too. In general, the material culture from the earlier Mesolithic period is characterized by small flint blades. These are known as microliths. And this is kind of interesting to me because it's very different from what we see in American archaeology. These little guys were too small to have been used on their own. And so they probably form part of a composite tool. And what they think that they might have used some of these microliths for had been to insert them along the length of a wooden handle to form a cutting blade that's lined with several of these little microliths. And Basically, this contrasts a lot with the later Mesolithic period because it, like what we see in American archaeology, is characterized by larger flint blades, often referred to as bond flakes or butt-trimmed flakes, which could have been used on their own as a spear point or as a cutting knife. Again, much like what you see with archaeology in America going all the way back to the Paleo-Indian period and perhaps before if we consider some recent archaeological discoveries. In Neolithic Ireland, okay, this is a later period, about 4000 B.C. to 2500 B.C., this is the next phase that we look at. And people in this period brought with them a lot of ideas about food production. Basically, agriculture begins around this time. The first farmers in Ireland also introduced the earliest pottery vessels. They were also utilizing a much wider set of artifacts, which included stone axes, again, larger flint tools. There were saddle kerns. There were grinders used for corn and things like this. They also lived in different structures at this point. They lived in large stone or rather rectangular houses. Some of them actually were built of stone. Uh, they had deep slot trenches that would have been used to support these tall wooden walls. There were roofs that were most likely thatched, although there were different varieties of roofing that they used too. And they essentially practiced a mixed farming style growing crops that included wheat. They were herding cows and sheep and also still gathering wild foods. But one of the most distinctive aspects of Neolithic Ireland was the introduction of new and monumental forms of burial architecture, which we're going to get into here in a moment. These, of course, are the megalithic tombs. And they included a variety of monument types, and four of the most notable being court tombs, portal tombs, passage tombs, and wedge tombs. I'll talk a little more about that in a moment. The next era, Bronze Age Ireland, of course, is another major period in Irish prehistory. Initially, these new metal objects that they were bringing to light were fashioned out of copper and mainly consisted of axes and daggers. And the copper was actually being found from the Ross Island of Killarney, and that would be in modern-day County Kerry. But during the earlier Bronze Age, burials also occurred. And this is of particular significance because in archaeological digs, something that they found is that the burials included cremated remains of humans. They were often accompanied by grave goods, and these most commonly consisted of small decorated pots known as food vessels. You might sort of make a corollary there to Egypt with the idea of we're going to send you away into the afterlife 
with things that you may need for the journey. And so food is something that is buried along with other items in these burials. Evidence for house remains once again found in this period, the Bronze Age, and it becomes more plentiful during this period than in the Neolithic. And then as we move into the most recent era, at least in terms of ancient archaeology for Ireland, the Iron Age, 500 B.C. to 400 A.D., the Iron Age remains kind of enigmatic for Irish prehistory uh, because it has essentially uh, a lot of houses that appear, but they have begun to look more circular, like the Bronze Age housing that we see. Small ring barrows are continued to be used by simple pit burials. Cremation continues also. There are a lot of ceremonial and tribal sites that are recognized from that period. And excavations at some of these reveal the presence of large buildings. A lot of people think these may be ceremonial buildings, but one of the weirdest things that was actually found from an Iron Age excavation was a Barbary ape skull on top of one of these sites, which seems to suggest that by the Iron Age, there absolutely must have been trade with the Mediterranean uh, for something like that to have been found there. Now, of course, we have talked already a bit about this area the so-called Bend of Boyne, or Bruna Boyne, as it's known in Ireland. It's located in County Meath, as Jason said earlier, on the eastern side of the Republic of Ireland. And this is the area that is home of some of Ireland's most famous examples of megalith culture, from all the aforementioned eras, but going back again, primarily probably to the Neolithic period. Uh, Ireland's most famous, arguably, is New Grange. It's about 5,200 years old. It's a passage tomb, and I want to talk just briefly about what that means before Jason gives us all the details about Newgrange itself. Passage tombs or graves are essentially narrow passages that are built from large stones or, again, megaliths. And so when we talk about all those different periods in archaeology of Ireland, we can refer to a megalith, and that is kind of a way way you could think about this is that is a general term we use for ancient um, monuments or for stones specifically that are erected in a way that was used as part of a structure or sometimes just standing stones, menhirs, as they're called in Europe, by themselves. And when it comes to these passage tombs, large stones or megaliths, which generally feature one or even many burial chambers, are covered by stone or earthen enclosures like what you see at Newgrange. Um, The passage tombs of this sort typically date back again to the Neolithic period or the late Stone Age, as we would call it. Some of the tombs, when possessing more than one burial area or chamber, sometimes also feature subchambers, which extend outward from the main or central burial chamber. And again, a popular motif you find in these subchamber complexes is a cross-shaped passage grave, which I find kind of interesting, mostly because, of course, these predate Christianity by about 3,000 years, and nonetheless, the cross or the crucifix or cruciform, as it might be referred to in relation to these subchambers, that motif was being used thousands of years beforehand. In a few instances, passage tombs are covered with a a cairn, which is basically a little mound of stones on top, which may serve as a memorial site or a burial marker. Although, in a lot of the passage tombs, something archaeologists notice that they are essentially void of any material remnants of human burial. I mentioned that there are some cremations and things found from this period, but a lot of the passage tombs don't have evidence of burial in them. That's not always the case, of course. And the passage tomb tradition is thought to have been brought up probably from the area of Brittany in modern-day northwestern France, where you find all kinds of very fascinating megalithic monuments. The Broken Men here, if you guys have ever seen that, it's now fallen over and split into four pieces, why they call it the Broken Men uh, men here. But it was erected more than 7,000 years ago, and when it stood up, keep in mind, they put this thing up 7,000 years ago, and it was 68 feet high and weighed 330 tons. So there were some engineers in the ancient world, and those colonists who eventually make their way up to Ireland brought these traditions of building these passage tombs with them when they settled in Ireland. Now, one final thing I'll add here, too, is that during 1961, there was a survey conducted by the two Irish scholars, Noalain and De Valera, and there were four separate categories of megalithic tombs that they identified at that time. Of course, we've talked about these passage tombs. But the other three are the court cairns, the portal dolmens, and then the wedge-shaped gallery graves. And essentially, these four comprise the different types that are found in different parts of Ireland. Now, what's important, of course, is that the passage tomb that we've described here, and Jason is going to tell us about the most famous one here in a moment, uh, that term probably actually has origins in Spain. The two aforementioned scholars probably borrowed that from the Spanish term tumbas de corredor, which is used for tombs in Cantabria, Galicia and also in the Basque country, but uh, of particular interest with regard to the other kinds of tombs is some are found elsewhere in Europe, others are not. For instance, if we look specifically at passage tombs, they are the only kind of tomb on this list that appears elsewhere 
to any significant degree. In some places you'll find them are Ireland, of course, and France, as we mentioned, but Britain, Scandinavia, Germany, uh, the Netherlands, Iberia, parts of the Mediterranean, and also even along the northern coast of Africa. The others, in many cases, are specific to Ireland or the regions close by geographically, and you don't find them elsewhere in Europe. Now, Jason, of course, the most famous of the passage tombs that we find there on the Bend of Boyne is Newgrange. And we have a lot, of course, that could be said about that. But why don't you give us some background about that famous and most enigmatic Irish site? Absolutely. Well, Newgrange, you know, no discussion of Ireland archaeology would be complete without talking about this site. Um, Simply put, it is one of the most important and fantastically uh, preserved and uh, maintained sites anywhere in Europe. I mean, hands down, fantastic site. So, uh, it is one of those passage tombs that you previously discussed. So while we do have the four different types, this one at, at Newgrange is a probably the finest example of a passage tomb you'll see anywhere uh, in Europe, arguably. Uh, so the Newgrange itself, the passageway with, within Newgrange is just less than about 60 feet long. And it leads into a chamber with three side recesses, kind of like you described earlier. This chamber, uh, it's roofed by what's called a corbelled vault. So it's vaulting up. Uh, This actually has remained intact and watertight without any conservation or repair for all of these years. So that alone within itself uh, is is a testament to the amount of skill that was used in creating this. Uh, The cairn that covers the chamber is estimated to weigh over 200,000 tons. And it's retained at its base by 97 massive curb stones. So these curb stones are basically uh, placed at the bottom as sort of a structural uh, component, but they tend to be very large, and and Newgrange has 97 of these, uh, which is quite impressive. As the typical Irish passage tomb um, is described, the recess on the right, as one enters in, is the largest and most ornate uh, of the three. On the floor of this recess, there's two stone basins. One is placed inside the other. The outer basin there is a superb example of the skill of these Neolithic uh, stone tools and makers. Uh, It's been shaped from solid granite. And, you know, as we look back to other cultures like those in Egypt and uh, other people who were utilizing this very, very hard stone, it really gives you some appreciation for what they were doing there at Newgrange because this is not easy to accomplish. Uh, As opposed to the other two recesses, um, they were carved from sandstone, nonetheless impressive, but, you know, to be able to shape that granite the way they did is, is a true testament to their ability. Now, archaeologists believe that the stone basins, basins essentially held the remains of the dead. Because the chamber was disturbed before proper excavation could be done, it's not really known how many people were originally interred there at Newgrange, but the remains of five bodies were recovered inside. Um, the original number, obviously, was probably much higher, but most of the bones found, as we mentioned before, are in a state of cremation with only very small amounts uh, amounts of, of the bodies being left unburned. Now, as far as the artifact side, uh, remaining in the grave at the time of its excavation were some small beads that were made of bone. Uh, again, we see that sort of a tradition here with Native American cultures. Uh, we all, they also found pendants, uh, some very highly polished stone balls. Um, undoubtedly, these objects probably held special significance within that burial ritual, just as they did here with the indigenous cultures in North America. Uh, It's possible that there were more spectacular objects that were there originally. You know, over time, those things tend to disappear as uh, looters and other people enter into the cave. But that is something to keep in mind. I mean, we're talking about something that's nearly 5,000 years old. So, you know, there's no telling what has come and gone over that amount of time here in such a widely noticeable tomb so anybody passing by would have certainly noticed it on the horizon and probably gone in to check it out so we don't know what's been lost at this point now there there is something that occurs here and it occurs throughout ireland scotland england um, and also here in the north american continent and that is the spiral and new grange is is known for this and so i want to take a moment to kind of just give a a brief description of these spirals because it's something that uh, we see that goes back and it's one of the most ancient symbols of a civilization. Spirals, concentric circles, it's sort of one of the oldest international, if you will, symbols that it seems like most cultures 
used at some point. Uh, for example, a design of concentric circles um, that are cut to the center by a stroke is known as a cup and ring. And this occurs in several different cultures throughout the world. The stroke was often oriented to an event in nature, such as a midpoint between the winter solstice and the summer equinox, or between the autumn equinox and the winter solstice. So this midpoint was a time when noticeable changes in nature were occurring. So we're looking at things like you know, shearing of sheep, uh, the return of migratory birds, the growth of you know, early spring flowers, things like that, in the autumn, leaves falling from the trees. So all of these things, as we know, throughout different cultures have been marked. Um, actually, the, the um, oldest handmade spiral that we know of, at least that I've been able to found in my research, dates back to 18,000 BP. Wow. Uh, and it's actually made from mammoth ivory, and it was found in Siberia. So, I mean, that gives us some insight to how old this symbology really is. But the spirals at Newgrange themselves they're not just placed haphazardly. There, there's a, there seems to be a, a reason, a method to them. But talking about, you know, the, the internal workings of the tomb, of the passage tomb, uh, there's a couple things you need to, we need to talk about. So the, the megalithic cairn itself, it provides really some of the earliest evidence for an organized society along with this symbology of the spiral. Many of the, the cairns have passages leading to a central chamber, just like we see at Newgrange. So you have large stones. These are referred to as orthostats. Those are the stones that form the wall of the passage. Um, and then they're generally roofed by large flat stones on top. Newgrange is one of the most ornate and well-preserved out of any of them that we could discuss here today. Um, there are literally hundreds of patterns carved onto the curb stones and orthostats at Newgrange and with a huge variety of patterns. But one thing that definitely sticks out is the amount of circles, spirals, arcs, serpentine forms, uh, there's zigzags, uh, what they call a lozenge shape, which is something, again, we see here in North America, star shapes, radials, just a, a huge variety. However, the lozenge and the zigzag patterns, that's the most common motif that we see at Newgrange. Uh, however, the spirals themselves are far more prominently displayed. Uh, when you get to the entrance of Newgrange, which in itself is, is pretty striking, um, so the entrance itself is is set at about 135 degrees southeast to the winter solstice. Uh, so the light of the new sunrise on the winter solstice enters the main chamber of the cairn through a roof box at the entrance. Um, this is marked by a very ornate curb stone. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful. If you go online and take a look at it, it's, it's done very well. And even today, being so old, it's, it's very distinctive. It's, it's not been weathered uh, to such a degree that you can't recognize it. Uh, so when you go in on the right of the line, there's a double spiral, okay, uh, which appear to coil to the center counterclockwise. The left side is a trifold pattern, and each spiral is turning clockwise. So you have opposing spirals there. This mimics the movement of the sunbeam on the floor of the passage on the days leading up to the winter solstice. So the sunbeam then begins to diminish in length in the days following the solstice, reversing the direction of the spiraling movement. And that is what's depicted there on that stone. Uh, so that in itself is pretty striking because uh, Newgrange is one of those places where you can actually go experience it. However, it's done by lottery and you do have to win a lottery to be there on that particular day to witness it. Oh, wow. But, I didn't know that. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's a much sought after experience, but it's, um, it's one of those that is certainly something you would remember forever. What we see there is a use of this very old, important uh, symbol of, of man, of civilization. And in this case, it's utilized in such a way as to depict the movement across the floor uh, on that very important date. So, again, we see the use of culture. We see the use of symbology. And what always strikes me about these types of symbols, and regardless of the culture that we're referring to, there always seems to be that vein that runs through all of humanity, regardless of what culture it is, where it's located in the world, there's just certain things that seem to resonate. And we see that at Newgrange, and we see it at places like Chaco Canyon, and we see it through the petroglyphs and pictographs all throughout North America, all across Europe, down into Africa, uh, down into Australia. And there's just a certain set of symbols, such as the spiral and concentric circles, that seems to surpass 
all cultures and it ties us all together in a way. And I think there's something really noble and inspiring about that. It's fascinating. I think a lot of people kind of misread it, though, honestly. I think a lot of people are like, see, the spiral occurs here, and then halfway across the world, people had it there, and then you go another quarter around the world, and it's there, too, so these people all must have been in contact. Again, that coming back to that idea of where diffusion ideas can get really out of hand. To me, whether it's a spiral or whether it's the cruciform shape or any other symbol that I guess humans have a preponderance over time of falling onto and using for ritual or symbolic purposes of any kind— it seems to me that these are something that stem from within the mind more than, than you know, from evidence of an archaeological past that dictates a lot more traveling around the world. I mean, I'm sure there was a lot going on back in the day that we didn't know about. We're learning more and more about that. The watercraft discoveries are helping show that. But, again, these symbols, their prevalence and their similarity around the world, to me, again, it says that there is something, I think, deep within us, almost in a Jungian way, a kind of an archetypal resonance from within that we create and we place in our artwork. And the fact that that similarity exists to me on in those terms is even more interesting than the idea of the suggestion without proof, of course, of diffusion going back thousands and thousands and thousands of years, uh, as is often cited in a lot of fringe archeology span uh, source publications. But I do want to point out something else, by the way, Jason, about that uh, box window there and the relevance of the winter solstice at Newgrange. You know, I want to cite E.C. Krupp's wonderful book, Echoes of the Ancient Skies, which is really kind of the book on archaeo astronomy, in my opinion. And James, you'll really appreciate this too, because this has a geological corollary too. And I cite uh, something he says on page 36 of the book. He says, um, and this is at the Newgrange excavations that occurred under D.D.A. Simpson. He said, Simpson found a concentration of quartz around the burial kist at Newgrange. He said, so much more quartz was scattered in and around the cairn that Simpson concluded it originally wore an envelope of the gleaming white crystal. There was a lot more of it back in the day, in other words, than is actually prevalent now. He said, ritual deposits of quartz, quartz vein stones, and entire boulders of quartz are encountered at many stone rings and chambered cairns. The entire facade of Newgrange is wrapped in quartz. And he said that the plugs in its winter solstice window box were also quartz. He said, whatever the stone meant in detail to the megalith builders, it seems to have had something to do with death, ceremony, and the sky. Now, guys, listen. You think about, for instance, in the Native America series where they go into the tunnel deep beneath Teotihuacan. They get into that tunnel and they see that they've used reflective stones to align the surface, well, the top portion of that tunnel, so that when they would have carried light into it, presumably it would have resembled stars. And there seems to me at least, and maybe I'm interpreting this again wrongly, we want to be careful. And I've said plenty about diffusion, but I mean, to me, there are distinctive characteristics that are so similar between some of the Mesoamerican and the Mexican archaeological sites and the Mississippian sites in North America uh, as you move further north. For example, the winged serpent motif. I mean, a lot of things are really similar. But the fact that they seem to adorn the ceiling as though it were mirroring the stars or the Milky Way that, to me, is very similar to the Mississippian tradition uh, of the Milky Way representing the path of souls. I wonder if there isn't, at very least, a similar archaeoastronomic component to the use of quartz at Newgrange in relation to stars and the reflective capacity of the quartz. And again, as Krupp actually says in his own book, he said it seems that the quartz had something to do with death, ceremony, and the sky. James, what do you think about the prevalence of the quartz there at Newgrange? Well... You know, I was reading about the geology of, you know, I was talking about the geology of Ireland earlier. And and, um, and now that I've read that, you know, quartz uh, and quartz veins and, you know, quartz deposits would be, should be pretty prevalent, you know, in that area. And, you know, I don't know about the ceremonial uses of it, but quartz, you know, as a, as a rock or, it, or, you know, as itself really is, is completely unlike any other, any other rock or stone that you, you, you know, you, you'd find. So, um, in, in my mind, you know, just, just the, just the nature of quartz makes it seem like it's special somehow. And I can remember even when I was a little kid, I'd find a quartz and it was, you know, a piece of quartz or my dad would bring home a quartz crystal or, and the stuff is really cool. It is. So, I mean, if you're going to make your, you know, particular ceremonial, um, construction stand out or have something really special about it, quartz is probably going to be the way to go, yeah. you know, just because it looks it looks special. It does. And I just found it kind of fascinating that 
when we see these kind of things in our North American archaeological studies, I guess actually, guys, there's been a lot of corollaries that we've made today. That has obviously been on our mind with our recent southeastern trip, but everywhere you go in the ancient world, you find these similarities. And obviously, I think, like you said, as a child, I did the same thing, James. I would go and I would pick up quartz. And to me, if I even still, if I find a quartz, that little Morrow Mountain point I found uh, on my father's property a while back, he and I were out walking, and there was this beautiful little Morrow Mountain quartz point. And of course, I called Jason immediately when I found it and said, Jason, look what I found. <laughs> I didn't know what a Morrow <laughs> Mountain point was really at the time. What is he, this? <laughs> yeah, he helped me identify it. And um, beautiful little piece of, of quartz, but also one that was fashioned into a projectile point around 4,000 years ago or so. Um, and that is fascinating, but it doesn't even have to be an artifact for quartz to be appealing to the eye, and we're naturally drawn to it. I'm not surprised that people in the ancient world were also. One more quick passage, too, from Krupp's book. And again, this is a book I highly recommend to anybody who is interested in the archaeoastronomy of the ancient world. The fact that people in ancient times absolutely were watching the sky, and that's one of the pivotal things about Newgrange, is of course its celestial alignment with the solstices, like so many of these other sites that we visited and that you see all over the world in relation to archaeology. But Krupp also writes on page 125 in the book that the winter solstice can be the death of the year and the birth of the year. And this, by the way, coming back to what he said in that earlier passage I mentioned about death ceremony in the sky, okay? He said, winter solstice can be the death of the year and the birth of the year. Combining sunrise with the winter solstice suggests both death and rebirth. Death for certain is part of Newgrange. It was, after all, a tomb, but the cremated bones cocooned within it seemed too few to represent a community cemetery. The deposits of ash are small and perhaps special. They may be symbolic components of a structure designed more or less for ritual, uh, more or less for ritual than for disposing of the dead, uh, penetration of a darkened chamber by revivifying sunlight makes the event seem like a metaphor modeled on fertility, sanctified by the dead, and mobilized by the sun. Newgrange as a communal enterprise served a communal purpose. It embodied a celestial purpose that organizes the world and energizes life. It reflected back to the people who built it the theme that prompted them to do so. Whatever it meant to them in detail does not matter. Their sense of community and their sense of place in the world were enhanced by a monument that brought the sky in touch with the earth. As in Egypt and China, at Cahokia and Palenque, their dead had joined the cosmic circuit. Their mortal remains carefully consecrated in the symbolic landscape preserved the world's order for the living left behind. While Newgrange is a singular site that's entirely important to the history of Ireland, Rathcrogan is something that is a bit more of a complex, if you will. Uh, this site features prominently in Irish mythology. Uh, this is a much bigger site, and it's actually six square kilometers, and it encompasses over 240 archaeological sites. Now, of these sites, 60 of them are protected national monuments. These include caves, burial mounds, ring forts, medieval field systems, ritual sites, linear earthworks. So again, you know, they say location, location, location. Well, this is the case with this particular site. Now, it overlooks the valley of the River Shannon, which was key to providing a good water supply and communication routes. Uh, it is situated basically on a fairly low-lying area. It's a limestone-capped area with boulder clay, which makes it very suitable for farmland. So this would have been a perfect place to build such uh, a large and important complex of different structures over time. There we find an array of different archaeological treasures, one of which uh, I want to touch on here because we talk so much about mounds here in North America. But this site of uh, Rathcrogan has mounds of its own. In fact, it has 28 identified burial mounds within that complex. Um, the Rathcrogan mound itself has been shown to have a complex combination of features not only within the mound, but around it as well. So investigations have revealed that an enclosure some 370 meters in diameter surrounding the mound and encompassing many other monuments is present there at that one particular site. 
Now, this is all part of the overall site. Again, six square kilometers, very, very large. Now, the history here uh, it dates, you know, all the way back from the earliest Neolithic times up through the uh, early medieval, late medieval, and so on, up, you know, until mo more recent times. But what's important about this site is that it's the home and base of much of Ireland's myths and legends. So Rathcrogan is a focal point uh, of ancient sagas, uh, legends, uh, stories of old. Its status in this context is mainly due with the association uh, of a legendary queen known as Queen Maeve and her various uh, cast of consorts, if you will. Something else that's located there in the site besides the mounds itself that I find to be of primary interest is what's known as the Cave of the Cats. Now, this is actually a, a natural fissure in the limestone. Um, it's particularly associated with the goddess of war known as Morrigan. Uh, it's been described as some as the gate to the underworld or the gate to hell. In many tales, uh, magical animals and spirits emerge from the cave at Samhain or Halloween. So as we discussed on one of our previous shows, um, some would say that this may be one of the origin points for those holidays that we've come to admire and, and respect, and participate in the North American culture. This may possibly be an origin point or an origin story at the very least for Samhain or what we call Halloween here in North America. And so often in anthropology and archaeology, we just focus on the artifacts. We focus on the monuments. But in this case, uh, this goddess, Morrigan, she kind of caught my attention. And one part of that anthropological study that I always enjoy is the myth. Uh, so I wanted to delve into who she was a little bit more and come to find out that Morrigan is one of the triple goddesses in Celtic mythology. So she represented what we consider to be the circle of life. She was associated with birth and death. And her name translates to the Great Queen or the Phantom Queen. Now, what's interesting about her is she was known as a shapeshifter. And she was, you know, sort of designated to look over the rivers, the lakes, the fresh water. Um, she's also the patroness of revenge and magic, and night, prophecy, witches and priestesses and things of that nature. Uh, what's most interesting is, again, we can see those parallels in other cultures of something that's very similar, whether it be the tales of the ancient Greeks or the Egyptians or the Native American cultures, the, the Mayan, they all seem to have, again, those very similar uh, veins of discussion and, and focus and mythology. Again, like you said earlier, Mike, it's not necessarily a case of uh, blatant diffusion as it is there's something inherent in the human that, that sort of builds these narratives to focus on the things that we interact with every day in our lives, whether it be birth or death or the sun rising or the changing of the seasons. And there's something uh, that I find very endearing about that. I think, though, in this instance, there may be a more direct corollary. That's really interesting what you're talking about, because, again, the name Morgan, if you remember your Arthurian legend, Morgan Le Fay, right? Ah, very good, yes. Yes, or and so, Morgana Le Fay. Yeah, and so when you're talking about a phantom queen and the idea, and actually, and tell you the truth, there's another parallel, too. There was something that sailors used to describe seeing called Fata Morgana, where there would be basically on the horizon, there would be a illusion. It would often give the impression of, due to the reflection of the water back up against the sky, it made the impression for the sailor at a distance that there might be a landmass. And so a lot of these phantom isles that are talked about in ancient folklore are attributed to that idea of Fata Morgana, which etymologically actually is similar to the idea of Morgan Le Fay. Again, this ancient phantom queen you talk about. You also mentioned she being one of the triple goddesses and an obvious parallel to the Norns of the northern peoples. Mm -hmm. And those three fates, Urd, uh, Verdandi, and Skold, uh, from the Norse traditions. Uh, the, uh, the weird sisters who are ref uh, referred to in Macbeth, of course, by Shakespeare. And the idea, again, if you look at uh, the Greek mythology and you have Medusa and the Gorgon sisters... Something about that mythology of there being uh, usually three sisters who practice witchcraft or something along those lines. And so the idea of triple goddesses, I'm sure that that's some sort of a corollary for the Norns as well. So like you said, I mean, these mythological components are fascinating, but the fact that they seem to share such obvious traits with one another and the fact that Ireland isn't so far removed from the Isle of Avalon, probably Glastonbury, of course, in England. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm sure that there is probably more than just a similarity that stems from the subconscious mind. I'm, there's probably an actual etymological and an actual sharing of myths by people who may have carried those traditions to Ireland long, long, long ago. Yeah, or vice versa. You know, those whole islands, the, the Orkneys and Scotland and Ireland and that whole general region that all share uh, a heritage, you know, to some degree. And it's interesting and profound that we can, again, connect all those together together. That particular area, having been to Scotland, having been to England, I feel that connection there because that's my heritage. I'm Scotch-Irish, but the next stop definitely needs to be the Emerald Isle. Yeah, it really does. Again, I have Welsh and English and Scottish heritage, some Irish heritage and also some German heritage. Uh, but I've only been to England and right up to the border almost to Scotland, never made it to Ireland either. So guys, we've got to make a trip. And when we go, we've got to visit the famous Loch Nell Serpent Mound, right? Uh, there in County Argyll, uh, near Oban. Uh, really quickly, just about that, because we haven't mentioned the Serpent Mounds either. Uh, Loch Nell is found about two miles southeast of Oban. Uh, nearby, you can also find an artificial mound shaped as a double curve, kind of like a serpent. There was a circle of stones on its head, which corresponds with the solar circles, once again represented on the heads of mystic serpents in Egypt. And right here in the good old U.S. of A., we have been to the Serpent Mound in Ohio, fellas, and there's a celestial alignment with the serpent's head there, too. Honestly, there are so many parallels that emerge when we start comparing these archaeological themes that it's kind of striking. But as we're just wrapping up here, and uh, we've got to talk about our favorite beverage, which we always keep on tap here at the Cross Time Pub here in a moment. Um, but I do want to mention just a couple of fun uh, myths about Ireland. Some of my very favorites, guys. And interestingly, these are sourced from a document, uh, which was actually an old uh, an old document from Norway dating back, if memory serves, to the 11 or 1200s. It's called the Speculum Regale, uh, which essentially means, that's the Latin, but it means the king's mirror. Um, now, there was a portion in this, and I'm going to read a couple of quotes, one from an abbreviated version and then the other from the 1917 translation by Lawrence Marcellus Larson, which is my favorite. Um, there was a portion in this old document about the natural wonders of Ireland, and part of the reason this document is so interesting is, again, in terms of that idea of diffusion and people reaching parts of the world in ancient times before we thought that they did, this document from its period seems to describe areas of the world prior to when we thought people got there. It describes a lot of weird mythology. Creatures like the Kraken are described, but two of my favorite, and it's, it's told as a, as a dialogue between a son and his father. But one of my favorite passages here, and this uh, from the 1917 translation by Larson, <laughs> from the King's Mirror, reportedly having happened in ancient medieval Ireland. Ready? He said, It once happened in that country, and this seems indeed strange, that a living creature was caught in the forest as to which no one could say definitely whether it was a man or some other animal. For no one could get a word from it or be sure that it understood human speech. It had the human shape, however, in every detail, both as to the hands and face and feet, but the entire body was covered with hair, as the beasts are, and down the back it had a long, coarse mane, like that of a horse, which fell to both sides and trailed along the ground when the creature stooped in walking. I believe, and then he concludes uh, his passage about the marvels of Ireland, but I love this document because, of course, this is an early report of a wild man or a mythological kind of a corollary to Bigfoot. And, you know, no matter what you make of all those kind of things, looking at this in terms of mythology as we are here, I love it because that may be one of the earliest reports of Bigfoot on record. <laughs> <laughs> but there was also a UFO report from the Speculum Regale as it relates to the myth and wonders of Ireland. Listen to this one, for instance, okay? Now, the account given is, again, very strange, and I interpret this entirely as being mythological. But the way it tells the story is that there was a church in Clana, okay? And they said one Sunday while the populace was at church hearing Mass, it happened that an anchor was dropped from the sky, and one of the flukes of the anchor got caught in the arch above the church door. The people all rushed out of the church and marveled much as their eyes followed the rope upward. They saw a ship with men on board floating before the anchor cable, and soon they saw a man leap overboard and dive down to the anchor as if to release it. The movements of his hands and feet and all his actions appeared like those of a man swimming in the water. When he came down to the anchor, he tried to loosen it, but the people at once rushed up and tried to seize him. Well, the bishop was present when this happened and forbade his people to hold the man, for said he it might prove fatal, as when one is held under the water. As soon as the man was released, he hurried back up to his ship, and when he was up, the crew cut the rope, and the ship sailed away out of sight. But the anchor has remained in the church since and has been a testimony to this event. 
And according to legend, that anchor was still kept at that church. Now, what's funny is that story, mythologically, uh, it, you find similar versions of that story in different parts of Europe, especially in different parts of Ireland and the British Isles. Uh, but I found it interesting that, again, that was attributed to Ireland in one of the earliest accounts given, of course, in this doc document from Norway. Uh, so those colorful little myths attributed to Ireland from early on, I found just kind of endearing and definitely weird. But often there have been modern researchers who look at them and say, look, you know, the same kinds of, kinds of weirdness that you read about in the fringe magazines, you know, what was happening in Ireland back in the day and elsewhere. I mean, another account it gives is literally of a kraken, a, a creature so large that it could it could pose as an island and, and sailors going by it wouldn't know the difference between a large creature and an island, things like this, and that it could swallow entire portions of the ocean in a single gasp. Obviously not a whole lot of historical basis behind that, but again, as myths, I find them fun. I really enjoy looking at history, mythology, and again, all these beautiful things. And Ireland probably has more of that than any other place I can think of. But something else that Ireland has afforded us that has changed my life and the way I see the world, my whole perspective on reality, is that famous beverage, which we always keep on tap right here in the Crosstime Pub. And it's time, once again, in discussing that favorite beverage of ours, to enter a realm of history that we know as the history of alcohol. The history of alcohol. Of course, I'm talking about Guinness. What discussion about Ireland would be complete without paying a little homage to Guinness, that most famous beverage? A couple of quick facts about Guinness that people generally don't know. Uh, it's got less alcohol than most types of beer or ale, it being, of course, a stout. And often when I'll talk to people about Guinness, they're like, oh, that's a little too heavy for me. And I always ask, what do you mean by that? And like, well, first of all, it's like drinking a loaf of bread. Did you know it also has fewer calories than most varieties of beer? So not only is it low on the calories, it's also low on the alcohol, but it's high in antioxidants, which, of course, is why many people will say if you're going to drink beer at all, Guinness is the ideal beverage. It's going to be lower calorie, lower alcohol, so you can enjoy more of it, <laughs> or at very least you can enjoy it in moderation, and it's not going to mess you up as bad, but it actually has a lot of antioxidants. So I think that really... A good, strong case can be made for all the reasons you should be drinking Guinness. And with that, I present to you the history of Guinness. In 1759, at the age of 34, Arthur Guinness signed a lease for the St. James Gate Brewery in Dublin. He leased this brewery for 9,000 years at an annual rent of 45 pounds. Hold on, 9,000 years? What? That's a long lease, my friend. It's... <laughs> Hey, when you're making good beer, I, I guess he was prognosticating that this was going to be around for a long time. So he really, when he signed the lease, he said, go ahead and sign me up. I'm going to be here for 9,000 years. We're going to be here until we die. And then a lot of other people, too, after that. <laughs> yeah, that seems to be the case. <laughs> so the brewery itself was only about four acres in size. Um, it had a little bit of brewing equipment in there when he first moved in. But despite this, Arthur quickly built up a successful trade. And by 1769, he had begun to export his beer to England. After Guinness began by brewing ale at St. James Gate, in the 1770s, he began brewing porter, uh, a drink that I think we can all agree that we enjoy just as much as our stouts. A new type of English beer at the time, porter, invented in London in 1722 by a brewer named Ralph Harwood, Porter was different from ale because it was brewed using roasted barley, giving the beer a dark ruby color and a rich aroma. Arthur's porter was successful, and in 1799, he decided to stop brewing ale altogether and concentrate on the porter alone. Arthur Guinness brewed different types of porter to suit different tastes, including a special export beer called West India Porter. This beer, still brewed today, and is now known as Guinness Foreign Extra Stout. Yeah. It actually accounts for 45% of all Guinness sales globally. It's popular in Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean. By the time Arthur died in 1803, he had built a successful brewing business with a promising export trade. Arthur's business was passed on to his son, Arthur Guinness II, who took over the brewery. The business was then passed on from father to son for five successive generations. And in the 1830s, the St. James Gate Brewery became the largest brewery in Ireland. Arthur II also expanded the export trade, and by the 1820s, shipments were being made to destinations as far away as Lisbon, Portugal, South Carolina, New York, Barbados, and Sierra Leone. Where are you thinking South Carolina they were sending Guinness, buddy? 
There's only one place, <laughs> Port of Charleston. Yes, sir. <laughs> home sweet home. Yeah. So you got a little time with your own hometown right there, my man. I do. And something I'll, I'll add to my, my pride. <laughs> yeah. Very happy about that. Uh, but wrapping up the story here, under Arthur Guinness II, the recipe for yet another type of porter was written down. This brew was known as Extra Superior Porter. Extra Superior Porter was a slightly stronger porter. It was designed for the British market. This beer, still brewed today, is known as Guinness Extra Stout or Guinness Original. And when we're not having it on draft, we will certainly take an Extra Stout any day. Is that right, guys? Yeah, absolutely. You know, what's kind of funny, though, about that is that, well, they said that the Guinness for an Extra is around 40 to 45% of their sales worldwide. Is that right? That's what it says. Yep. That's interesting. I bet you the, the reason is because, honestly, people do tend to like stronger beers, both in flavor and also alcohol content. Just look at the popularity of India Pale Ales. And although it's often said the history of the India Pale Ale was that when they were shipping ales to the British colonies in India, the beer often would spoil on the way there. And so they started brewing it at a higher alcohol content, which would preserve the beer better. And then it was able to you know, last the actual time that it took to get it down to the colonies and hence that stronger beer, the IPA, the India Pale Ale. So similar ideas, I guess, behind the stronger brews coming out of the Guinness Brewery. But my favorite, of course, is the good old-fashioned Guinness Draft. That's the way to do it, in my opinion, with that delicious, creamy head. James, you being the only one among us here who is, I guess we got to call you St. James, you're the only one who's ever brewed an Irish stout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, just some brewing notes on this. You know, the, the Irish stout, uh, you know, Guinness is, well, let me back up. Guinness is an Irish stout. In the tradition of Irish stouts, they're usually jet black or, you know, very dark. And, uh, you know, these types of beers have a sort of a roasty, sort of a coffee-like flavor aroma. And that's helped b- because there's a lot of uh, roasted barley uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the recipe. But otherwise, it's a pretty straightforward and a pretty simple recipe that I don't think has changed very much um, over the, you know, over the years. So, um, you know, the, and I've got a recipe here in front of me, and this is the one that I, that I use is um, you use for a five gallon batch of beer, you uh, use a, a pound of uh, roasted English barley. And the way I do it, it's, it's better this way. If you're, if you have a much more simple operation is you use a malt type of a syrup that's sort of pre-made Otherwise, you have to have more equipment and, and uh, uh, to process that, and then it's just a little bit of uh, just a little bit of hops, and then uh, and then yeast, and you basically just uh, you bring all that stuff together, and and you you uh, you start off by uh, steeping the uh, the grains, the barley, for I don't know, probably about thirty minutes, forty five minutes, something like that, with the water at about. Um, probably about 180 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, you don't want it to boil. You just want it to, you just want it to be good. And hot. It's just like steeping tea or anything else. And then you, you take that out and bring it to boil and you put your other, uh, put your other, uh, ingredients in. And, uh, in this case, so you, there's different types of beer. You put different types of hops in at different intervals in the, in the, in the boil. So, but in this case, you just put the hops in for the entire 60 minutes and then you let it cool off. And you uh, put it in your fermenter and add the yeast to it. Put it away for a month, and you've got a uh, dry Irish stout. Now, one of the things though that makes Guinness um, special is the way that they carbonate the beer. Yeah, <clears throat> they don't use just straight CO2 like most beers do. They use a mixture of CO2 and nitrogen, and that's what gives it that that uh, trademark really creamy uh, head when it's poured. Um, now the last time I made one, I don't have a nitrous oxide set up or a, a nitrogen a CO2 set up. I just use CO2, but it still has a really great head. It's just, it's, you know, it's a little bit different, but it doesn't really affect the taste of the beer. So I know you're going to ask about oyster stout. So <laughs> the, the difference between this and an oyster stout is during the boil, uh, the last 10 or 15 minutes of the boil, you just add raw oysters in the shell to the, uh, to the uh, to the wart, which is what it's called, as as you you know you're just cooking the beer, and then that's it. And it just that adds, it doesn't add a, like a fishy flavor or an oyster flavor, but it adds uh, some extra calcium to the beer from the shells from the oyster shells. So 
and it makes it even uh, you know smoother and, and creamier. But it's really, honestly, it's a really easy process to make this beer. That's really interesting. Jason, have you ever tried brewing beer before, or have you ever actually been there with someone when they were doing it? Um, I've been to like people's houses while they were in the process, but I've never you know taken part in actually doing any of the steps. Usually it was like, hey, man, I made some beer and it's, you know, it's not ready yet, but I haven't actually tried it my hand at it myself now. We used to have buddies here in Asheville that regularly uh, got together and they'd spend a whole day brewing beer and invite everybody over uh, to partake in the brewing process. And so I used to really enjoy that. I haven't done it in years, though. So what I what I propose is we head down, Jason, you and I, maybe we can rendezvous for a night in the holy city of Charleston. We can have Guinness on tap there someplace. And then let's head further south, make our way down to Mr. Waldo's domicile. And let's all get together. Let's brew the 7A Stout. I think it's time we do this. The Seven Ages Irish Stout must be brewed in the company of all the lads here present. What do you say, gentlemen? I concur. Make it so. We shall indeed. And hey, while we're making it so, we'll let you know how it turns out, but you can do this in the meantime. Head over to sevenages.org. Check out some of the content that we have available over there. This episode, of course, has show notes that will give you access to all the articles and resources that we used for this wonderful information about Ireland. Thanks again to Nikki Hart for suggesting this episode. You can send along suggestions, too. Just remember James, Jason, or Micah at Seven Ages. Dot org or tweet at us. You can also follow us on Instagram and check us out on YouTube. All the social media is all the time. Seven Ages can be found in all the corners of the web. All right, guys, that wraps it up. Time to refill our Guinness glasses. For some reason, I tend to be craving one at the moment. So shall we wrap it up? We shall. And I can't imagine why you would be craving a Guinness. Mm. At this time. Yeah. It always seems to end this way, doesn't it, gentlemen? Yeah, indeed. Well, yeah. all this talking, you know, you work up a thirst. And, of course, with this discussion about Ireland, no better way to quench it than with a Guinness. So... We'll wrap it up right there, folks. Thanks, as always, for joining us on this little jaunt through space and time. It is the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Audio Journal.